Good morning, everyone. Welcome on this rainy Friday in April. All these April showers are bringing our May flowers, so we're thankful. We have gratitude. I'm Dr. Laylee Mapayan, and I'm the executive director of the Wellesley Centers for Women at Wellesley College, and I'm also a professor of Africana Studies. It's one of the reasons that I was most excited about coming here was because I knew that Dr. Philomena Steady was here, and she was famous in my universe, and I thought, I'm going to be at the same school as her. That's going to be super exciting, and I'm going to be in her department, too. So when I learned that she had chosen to retire, of course, I was a little heartbroken. But I also understood that after such a long and illustrious career, she really deserved to go have fun somewhere. And um, I said, you know, I will not be satisfied with your leaving unless we have a symposium in your honor. What sets Dr. Steady's work apart? is the fact that she has always focused on African women's power and authority. African women's genius and the power of African culture generally on the world stage, whether politically, in terms of the environmental arena, or in solving gender issues. It is because of Dr. Steady's groundbreaking work going all the way back to the early 1970s that we even have a concept of African and now Africana feminism, and we can place the global African and Africana feminist discourse in conversation with other culturally situated feminisms shaping women's movements and society's pursuit of gender equality, gender equity, and environmental justice. Her breakout book, The Black Woman Cross-Culturally, published in 1981, put African feminism on the map during a moment when feminism in the United States was pivoting in response to the critical chorus of women of color feminists and womanists rising up to reshape and recontour feminist discourse and social movement. Scholars and students of women's studies in the room will recall the explosion of books in the early 1980s that included, for example, Sheree Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa's This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color, also published in 1981, closely followed by All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, Black Women's Studies, by Akasha Gloria Hull, Patricia Bell Scott, and Barbara Smith, published in 1982, Barbara Smith's Home Girls, a Black Feminist Anthology, one of the inaugural volumes issued by Kitchen Table Women of Color Press in 1983, a book that came out of Conditions 5, the 1979 special black feminist issue of the feminist journal Conditions, which in turn had been inspired by the 1977 pamphlet that later became known as the Kambahi River Collective Statement, or the Black Feminist Statement, which was developed right here in Boston. And who can, of course, forget Audre Lorde Zami, A New Spelling of My Name, published in 1982, and Sister Outsider, published in 1984, or Alice Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose, published in 1983. So I'm setting the context for an era of an explosion of black and Latino and Asian and you know, Native and Arab women coming on the scene saying, this is our feminism, and we are putting forward not just how we're intervening on today's feminism, but how we've had these feminist traditions and these womanist traditions going all the way back in our history, in our own cultures. That's the context in which the black woman cross-culturally came on the scene and made a huge, important intervention in how we understand this entire discourse. This was a prolific era for black women and other women of color seeking to reshape how we understand gender, gender concerns, and not just this, but also how to remake the world in general. Women speaking not just about women, but about the whole world and all its problems. Enter Dr. Philomena Steady, who made sure that African women's long history of power and authority and Africana women's bold visions of how to reshape society and the world were part of the picture. And this included women of continental Africa and women of the global African diaspora. Dr. Steady immediately achieved a place of high honor in this transformative discourse because the black woman crossed culturally. There was no other volume like it, then or since. And this could have been enough to cement her place in intellectual history, but she, of course, did not stop there. <laughs> 
While I will leave it to my colleague, Dr. Lacelli Fitzpatrick, to more fully introduce Dr. Steady moments from now, I wanted to begin this day with context about how and why Dr. Steady's career is singular and worthy of our celebration with today's symposium. And there are a few more things I want to say before concluding. First, I insisted that this symposium include a visual display of Dr. Steady's many books. And I hope you all saw that table back there. The books are there. If you pass that doorway and you don't look at them, you have not been at this symposium. <laughs> OK? The titles alone illustrate the arc of her contributions to Africana studies, women's studies, political anthropology, and environmental studies. And I just want to say their names. Female Power in African Politics, the National Congress of Sierra Leone, 1975. That's based on her dissertation research. The Black Women Cross Culturally, 1981, which I already mentioned. Women and Children First, Environment, Poverty, and Sustainable Development in 1993. Women and the United Nations, Reflections and New Horizons, 1995. And I'm not even mentioning all the technical reports she's written for the UN. That's another whole subject. <laughs> Women and the Amistad Connection, Sierra Leone Creole Society in 2001. Black Women, Globalization and Economic Justice in 2002. Women and Collective Action in Africa, Development, Democratization and Empowerment in 2006. Environmental Justice in the New Millennium, Race, Ethnicity, and Human Rights in 2009. And Women and Leadership in West Africa, Mothering the Nation and Humanizing the State in 2012. That's the book she had out the year I got here. And you can be sure that even though we are honoring her imminent retirement today, she is not done and there will be more books. <laughs> we know this. We know this. We will come again for another symposium in the future. Just know this. All right, second, Dr. Steady has not just been a scholar, but also an important and influential figure in the United Nations evolving women and gender apparatus, as well as the global woman and development arena. Dr. Steady was a consultant to the Secretariat for the United Nations Decade for Women, which as you know was from 1975 to 1995. She was also a deputy director of the branch for the advancement of women at the UN Secretariat in Vienna. I mean, she was the complete jet setter. A special advisor on women, environment, and development to the Secretary of UNSAID, which is the Earth Summit people in Geneva. And a special advisor to UNIDO regarding the integration of women into industrial development, as well as many other agencies and initiatives. She also co-founded or led a number of important international NGOs, most notably award or the Association of African Women for Research and Development, but also Women in Law and Development, also known as WILDAF, and the Women's World Summit Foundation. Again, this is just a sampling. To be frank, her CV is a 20-page plural single-spaced, and nearly half of it is in the UN NGO sector. In sum, this is no small woman here. She is our intellectual, academic, and activist Zoe, and today we celebrate her, her accomplishments, her influence, and the better world we all live in because of her. We will be treated to a faculty panel of other phenomenal women speaking to Philomena's legacy. And you're going to be thoroughly impressed by the people that we have assembled to speak to her legacy. After this panel, we'll enjoy a feast of African food, followed by an alumni panel and a student panel before our closing reception. And by the end of the day, we will all have a clear picture of why we named this symposium Africana Feminism and Women's Leadership in Global Context. Every single word of that title means something. It relates to her career. And young Wellesley women, a special note to you. This is what global leadership looks like. Yeah. Tune in and lean in <laughs> to the career of Dr. Philomena Study. So at this point, I'm going to turn your attention to an official welcome from Wellesley College's president, Dr. Paula Johnson. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there today to celebrate Professor Steady's remarkable career and contributions to Wellesley and the world. But I want to offer some thoughts on all that she's given our community through her life's work. It was through the African Women's Leadership Conference that I got to know Professor Philomena Steady and her scholarship on models of African women's leadership. Her voice was essential at the conference. Over her academic career, her work has been vital in advancing new perspectives and approaches in Africana studies. 
Professor Steady's focus is at once international and intensely local. Her intersectional scholarship helps us understand and visualize how local communities shape and are shaped by our globalized world. It provides new roadmaps for female leadership. In the Academy, she's an essential member of a vibrant, necessary community of feminist and Africana scholars who are instituting and innovating models and programs that interrogate established conventions. In short, she is a pathbreaker. As a teacher, Professor Steady plays a critical role in educating a new generation of women leaders. She pushes her students to critique dominant paradigms and exposes them to scholars, experts, and resources that represent a wide variety of perspectives. As we focus on advancing women's leadership at Wellesley College, it is so important to embrace the models of leadership that exist in the world. Philomena Steady's contributions to expanding our understanding of the power and influence of the women of Africa will live on as we educate the next generation of students who will make a difference across the globe. How appropriate that we are honoring Professor Steady here in a symposium exploring Africana feminism and women's leadership in a global context, a field Professor Steady has given so much to as a scholar and educator. Thank you, Professor Steady, for your scholarship and for your contributions to the Wellesley community. We are so much richer for having you. Your body of work as a scholar and teacher embodies what I have long believed, that the surest way to change the world for the better is through educating and empowering women. Congratulations on this honor. All right, at this point, I'd like to welcome to the podium my colleague, Professor Giafreda Soro, who is the Swahili professor at Wellesley College and a member of the Africana Studies Department faculty. I'm Jumbo. I'm Barigani. Good, so my name is Professor Soro. I teach Swahili, and uh, I've also been at, in the department for seven years. And I've also benefited from the leadership of Professor Steady and also from her mentorship. So on that note, I would like to thank the foreign departments that made this program possible. I would like to thank the Africana department that also houses Swahili language, which I teach, Wellesley Centers for Women, the Department of Anthropology, Art Department, East Asian Languages and Cultures, Education Department, English Department, French, History, Music, Philosophy, Psychology, Religion, Sociology, Spanish, Women and Gender Studies, the Dean of Students Office, Harambe House, Slater International, the Black Task Force, the Freedom Projects, CLCE, and all the people who made this program possible. Thank you all. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Lacelle uh, Fitzpatrick to come up and introduce Philomena's study before her remarks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. It is indeed rather humbling and a distinguished honor to introduce Dr. Philomena Chioma study a truly phenomenal woman who has touched so many lives and hearts as evidenced by your presence. In celebration at her farewell symposium today, in the Caribbean, Jamaica to be more precise, there's a fitting part we're saying for her, and I would like you to repeat after me. She lickle, she lickle. but she talawa. She lickle, but she talawa meaning she might be small in physical stature, <laughs> but mighty in strength. Yep. Well, the fame playwright Shakespeare had said it a little differently, and I quote, 
And though she be but little, she is fierce. I rather like the Jamaican vision. <laughs> For these are the words that always come to mind whenever I think of this little giantess. Professor Philomena Chioma's study is undoubtedly a woman whose shoe size is no match for the enormous strides and footprints that she has made across time and space. A woman who embodies the fullness of womanhood and gives meaning to womanism and feminism. The unfettered and unbridled spirit that simultaneously defies yet assumes form and rises to the occasion. Never want to concede or buckle under pressure. A woman whose passion and purpose and whose heart would take her from the shores of Sierra Leone to transform lives all over the world. Professor Study attended a liberal arts institution in her undergrad pursuits, the Smith College, where she earned her BA in government. At the graduate level, she earned her MA in anthropology from Boston University and later PhD in social anthropology from Oxford University, London. Professor Study has conducted extensive field work throughout, the, throughout Africa and the African diaspora in the Caribbean, Europe, and North America, where, he, where she has contributed to revolutionizing the academic landscape with her prolific intellectual presence and scholarship. Laboring in the vineyards, giving birth to rich thought and minds, Professor Study is unquestionably a leading scholar custodian, and life giver to several seminal works. Among them is the award-winning book titled The Black Woman Cross-Culturally, of which are currently on display. Professor Study has taught at several universities, including Yale, Boston, California State University in Sacramento, where she was also chair of the Women's Studies Program and University of Sierra Leone. However, we at Wellesley College have the bragging rights to date <laughs> of having her the longest. 22 years where she has contributed significantly to our institution in the spheres of teaching and academic service, including chair of the Africana Studies Department, while lecturing and shaping minds on societies and cultures of Africa, African women, social transformation and empowerment, the black woman, woman cross-culturally, South Africa, environmental justice, race, and sustainable development, medical anthropology, urban development, and the underclass, the, the third world urbanization, quite a mouthful. In addition to these thought, th thought courses, Professor Study has led the winter session program to Jamaica, which is a very important aspect of Wesley's college's academic offerings, learning through overseas cultural immersion. In her other non-academic and outstanding capacities, Professor Study has functioned as a director of the United Nations in Vienna and a special advisor and senior consultant to several international organizations. She assisted in the development of four international plans of action for gender equality and advancement of women. Professor Study's impressive accolades include, but are not limited to being a founding member of the Association of African Women of Research and Development, and the former president of the Women's World Summit Foundation, an international G NGO based in Geneva, Switzerland. Professor Study has also been a, a member on several advisory boards to deal with women's affairs, such as the Encyclopedia of Child Third World Women, the United Nations Steering Committee on Women in Least Developed Countries, and the Commission of Anthropology of Women. Despite her many travels and prominent international appointments, our little but tallower woman never truly <laughs> left, left home. As proven by her intensive work and frequent visits to her home country, her undying love for her husband, Dr. Henry Maduka Study, her three children, and, and those to whom she has not given biological birth to, that I too now wish to stake claim. <laughs> her, 
deeper love for music and dance cannot go unmentioned. <laughs> there is no denying that Professor Steady is well loved, as demonstrated by your travels from all parts of the globe to be here today to pay homage and honor to this outstanding woman. Indeed, Professor Steady has left a noble legacy rooted in fertile ground, where my colleagues and I, and those who will later join us at Wellesley, shall not only pick of its fruits, but continue to plow and sow the seeds of success and the tremendous inspiration she bequeathed to us for both the current and future generations. Beyond her sterling role as chair, Professor Studies' maternal instinct has guided and shielded us in numerous ways. It is therefore fitting that a symposium of this magnitude be dedicated to her. And so I join the chorus in warmly welcoming you to Wellesley and certainly thanking you for leaving your other important business, I am sure, to join us in the celebration of a woman whose middle name, Chioma, means a gift from God, as she has truly been a gift to us. And albeit through marriage, some might add, vicariously, she has also lived up to the name Steady, <laughs> a, a boast I am sure her devoted husband would endorse, for I have never seen a more steady head hands and feet. Yes. She has further reminded me that she's not retiring, <laughs> but moving on to the next stage of her life. But it seems more like she's shifting gears and retiring her wheels to go full speed ahead by GPS. <laughs> Professor Study, thank you for all your love and personal sacrifices and for all you have done for us women at Wellesley, even for our men too. And I dare say for women the world over, as you are truly a gift from God to us. Thank you and I love you. It is indeed a supreme honor to be standing before you today in celebration of my retirement. I would also like to congratulate the highly accomplished faculty members that are also retiring this year and wish them the best for this important life cycle transition. I cannot say enough kind words of appreciation to my faculty colleagues who have supported me and my department and who continue to excel in all areas and to provide an atmosphere of friendly academic debate and discussion at Wellesley and beyond. When I came to Wellesley in 1997, I brought with me experiences as a professor in other institutions and at the international level, I helped prepare a number of plans of action for gender equality and the advancement of women. And as one of the leaders of the research and policy analysis team, in many ways, the work was similar to academia in terms of the research, but the political climate, the power dynamics, <laughs> and the high stakes <laughs> involved at the UN make academic politics seem like child's play. <laughs> I remember the pride I felt in contributing to the drafting of the recommendation that all institutions of higher learning establish women's studies programs. Today, these programs and departments are flourishing all over the world. In my 22 years at Wellesley, a large number of which was spent chairing the Africana Studies Department, I can say that the future of the department looks bright and exciting with highly accomplished and established faculty of international repute and newly recruited faculty who are not only rising stars in their fields, but also first rate human beings. We hope to continue to have the support of the president who said such nice things about me. <laughs> so I'm a fan of hers forever now. <laughs> and the administration, and to strengthen our collaborative efforts with colleagues in other departments. During my tenure at Wellesley, 
Much has changed, but so much remains the same. I have been through the administration of three presidents, Walsh, Bottomley, and Johnson, all of whom had different leadership styles, but were committed to excellence in scholarship, teaching, service, and in building inclusive and diverse communities within and beyond Wellesley. When I came to Wellesley, there were slightly more male faculty in 1997 than female faculty. But the data for 2018 show that the gap is closing and women have surpassed men in terms of full-time faculty appointments in all ranks, with male faculty at 28% and female faculty at 44%. However, if we, you know, since we're all analysts and scholars, if we examine the data closely, it becomes clear that there is gender disparity in terms of the nature of the contracts. Female faculty members outnumber male faculty members in the non-tenure track positions of lecturer and visiting lecturer and so forth. With regard to black faculty, the numbers of tenure track faculty have actually declined from 15 in 1997 when I came to 11 in 2018. I hope that going forward, these numbers will increase to truly reflect Wellesley's commitment to diversity and inclusive excellence. On the level of the administration, however, there has been some amazing improvements. We now have five African-American women in high leadership positions, something I never thought would be possible at Wellesley. It is to the credit of the college then that we have African-American women in the positions of president, Dean of Students, Dean of Admissions, Director of Institutional Research, and our dearly beloved Lely Mapayan, who is the direct, Executive Director of the Wellesley Centers for Women. All of these women are outstanding examples of role models for every woman, I emphasize, every woman, in terms of their qualifications, personalities, and ability to motivate others and provide enlightened leadership. Wellesley has had many challenges over the years, including challenges of difference, racial incidents, and political protests. As a community of scholars, teachers, staff, and students, we still have a long way to go to unlearn some of our old prejudices and conscious as well as unconscious biases. We have had to face the constant challenge of budget cuts that affect faculty and staff positions and the curriculum. This is gonna be hard. Mm -hmm. To my students, to the students of Wellesley, what can I say? I will miss you the most but you will always have a place in my heart and mind. You are so special, so bright, so ambitious, so empathetic, and so well behaved. Now I, start, I sound like a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will break all kinds of ceilings. Not only the gender biased glass ceiling, but ceilings of ignorance, bigotry, intolerance, discrimination, and exclusion. You have inspired me so much, and I have learned how to think like a member of your generation, believe it or not. <laughs> and that has brought new meaning to my life. By being around you, I have remained young at heart because of you. That's how much you have influenced me and I thank you for that. My future plans are simple. 
I will continue to be driven by my insatiable curiosity, <laughs> which is no surprise to anyone who knows me. My research interests in female leadership will expand to include more focus on the followers of leaders, as much as the leaders themselves and the connection between the two. I will also be driven by my outrage over the alarming rate of maternal mortality, especially of black women in Africa and the African diaspora, when numbers can be as high as 800 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in some African countries. I plan to work with a team and examine some of the ways in which the political economy and cultural determinants can contribute to both creating and alleviating the problem. In bringing forth new life, these mothers are dying needlessly from preventable causes. We have to look for solutions outside of the medical system, which is failing these women. The team plans to examine the problem in the US, Haiti, and Sierra Leone, and see how cultural systems can be harnessed to, prove, to, to arrest this alarming problem. I am honored by this tribute and wish to thank the organizers of this symposium, especially Professor Lely Mapayan and my department, and many sponsors for their generous contributions. I am sure we're going to have a productive and successful exchange of ideas, a celebration and a warmest appreciation of each other and of our collective contribution to the academy, to our students, and to humanity. I will miss Wellesley, but I will be taking many fond memories of Wellesley with me. Wellesley is a part of me, and I like to think that I will always be a part of Wellesley. I'd like to welcome our colleague, Professor Kelly Carter Jackson, to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. First, I just want to say that I would be uh, remiss if I did not uh, just take two seconds just to say thank you to Professor Steady. I think I can speak on behalf of all of the junior faculty. I know uh, Dr. Chipo Dendere is not here and the Sully uh, Fitzpatrick that we feel honored and humbled to be in a position to pick up the torch that you are passing to us. We hope and pray that we can preserve your legacy, that we can promote models of excellence and empowerment to the succeeding generations. You have left a huge gap in our department, um, but we are gonna strive as best as we can to model everything that you have modeled to us. So for that, I, I wanna borrow a line from Oprah Winfrey, who I think borrowed it from Maya Angelou, <laughs> in which she says, you make me proud to spell my name, W-O-M-A-N. So with that, I just wanna say thank you and introduce our speaker uh, for this morning. This is Dr. Um, Obioma Nemeke. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Dr. Nemeke, a multilingual, widely traveled scholar, social reformer, is the Chancellor's Professor of French and Women's Studies in the African and African Diaspora Studies uh, Department and a former director of the Women's Studies Program at Indiana University in Indianapolis, Indiana. Professor Nemeka is also the current president of the Association of African Women Scholars, AAWS, and she is an expert in the fields of gender and women's studies and development. She also serves as the founder and president of the Association of African Women Scholars and has collaborated on global networks of scholars and activists committed to social transformation. Professor Nomeka has received numerous awards and national inter international awards, as well as grants and fellowships, such as the Rockefeller and MacArthur Fellowship. And she is also a member of the board of directors for many international and non-governmental organizations, NGOs, uh, and the editorial, she serves on the editorial and advisory board of several refereed uh, scholarly journals and book series. As an expert in African 
and African Diaspora Studies, Development, Globalization, Women and Gender Studies, Human Rights, Literary Studies, Research, Teaching, and Consultancy for the United Nations, the World Bank, Governments, International Agencies, and Academic Institutions um, that she has done with speaking engagements and active participation in national and international conferences all around the world. Professor Nameka has delivered over 100 keynote addresses, lectures, and papers in more than 30 countries and five continents. Can I have your miles? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> she has published extensively in the following areas of areas of development, women and gender studies, human rights, and African and African uh, diaspora studies. She's also the author and or editor of 12 books and the author of over 60 articles and book chapters and an editor of the 10 volume Women in African uh, Diasporic Collection. So without further ado, Dr. Mecca will speak to us today on expanding, um, expanding feminist visions. Thank you so much. Listening to you as I kept saying, is that me? <laughs> I thank Wexley College for inviting me to this event that celebrates a great African woman. It's truly an honor for me to be given this opportunity to say a few words about Professor Philomena Chioma Steady, a true pioneer who has inspired and mentored thousands across the globe. When she told me she was retiring, I laughed. <laughs> I said, with your passion, your commitment, you're not gonna retire. But we take this as a juncture in your long journey in helping humanity. Thank you, Philomena, for giving your Atlas shoulders to all of us to stand so we could see clearly, so we could see far and wide, so we can see deeply, dive deeply into the inner recesses of feminist scholarship to rescue the African woman. Your work has inspired me and I'm going to say a few words about what I'm doing, right, you know, what I've been doing in the last you know, almost more than one decade. I will start with that and also end with that because you have taught me what it is to be a scholar of African women. You have to be with African women, work in Africa and work with African women. Philomena, I learned from you. My work in Africa in the past decade or so, entailed collaborating with grassroots constituencies and non-governmental organizations that are working for change. Cultural change, political change, human rights, democratization, peace and conflict resolution, environmental justice. What I have learned in that arena and from them has compelled me to revisit my work, my earlier work, reassess my assumptions and my conclusions. I'm currently working on environmental justice in the Niger Delta, Niger Delta of Nigeria in investigating women's insurgency in the Niger Delta. I pose the following questions. Who is fighting? Against who? Against what? For who? How? Although I am mindful of the who and the what of the fight, I'm particularly interested in the how of that fight. What are the tactics and strategies they deploy in that fight? This collaboration leads me to ask crucial questions that urge a rethinking of feminist epistemologies and theories. 
What are the meanings invested in the strategies and tactics chosen by the women? What makes them potent and effective choices? What role does identity play? Is maternal politics feminist politics? What do cooking utensils, pistols, ladles, pots and pans used in protests, what do they symbolize? How does the utilization of these symbols of domesticity force a rethinking of the domestic space as it relates to power? Do the strategies and tactics deployed by women open a window to a greater understanding of the inner workings of their society regarding the pursuit of justice, particularly social and environmental <coughs> justice. And in talking to these women, I discovered they are fighting proxy wars, proxy war fights. They are fighting for their children. Who are the women fighting against? We are told that these women are fighting against the multinational oil companies. That is true, but it's not the whole, the whole truth. The women are fighting on all fronts. They are fighting multiple colonialisms. They are fighting the oil companies. They are also fighting their men, especially their chiefs who are incorporated and compromised by the oil companies. I will close my presentation with my collaboration this part of Africa at the end. But first, let me discuss briefly the history of the feminist movement to provide a context for examining Professor Steady's extraordinary work and brilliant career. I agree with Amat Aydu that African women were feminists long before feminism. The documentation of women's social activism and collective action in Africa dates far back as the 18th century. In the 19th century, women in North Africa owned and published feminist journals in which discussions of gender as well as religions and nationalist struggles were featured prominently. African women's participation in change has been encouraged and sustained by the capacity of many Africa, African cultures, the patriarchal context notwithstanding, they've encouraged these spaces to create spaces of female power in social and religious spheres. Feminist ideals of equity and resistance to all forms of domination are indigenous to Africa. and have propelled women's social action for centuries. African women that resisted and fought for change centuries ago did not label their action feminist because they did not speak English <laughs> or French for that matter. I believe that feminism is translatable, but it's not transferable. Mapping the trajectory of feminist theorizing in the past six centuries, the de six decades, is a study in contrast, relatedness, shifting boundaries, autonomy and connectedness, exclusion and the demand for inclusion, conflict and collaboration, border crossing and intersectionality, and more importantly, the expansion of horizons. In seeking to remake the world by demanding an end to all forms of gender-based discrimination, feminism as ideology and struggle has taken location-specific and culturally defined forms across time and space. As movement and intellectual tradition, Western feminism has contended with challenges from within women of color, and without women from non-Western societies. But along the way, engaged feminism of Western feminism engaged in the self-interrogation and redefinition 
that has given it its current breadth, depth, vibrancy, relevance, and salience. Feminism ought to constantly renegotiate its relationship to its own history. But to fully un account for the many faces of feminism, I always use it in plural. And in fact, in talking about feminist theory, I also prefer theorizing the process and not the reified construct. Because of this, like a work in progress, it keeps expanding. Imagine emerging from the politically charged era of the civil rights movement and anti-Vietnam War insurgency, the second wave of the feminist movement in the United States drew into its fold women of all stripes, although it was dominated by middle-class white women. The collaboration that emerged energized the sexual politics aimed at combating the gender-based exclusion and violence of patriarchy saw its first cracks in the 1970s when women of color, mostly blacks, Latinas, and Chicanas led a revolution within a revolution by challenging the many ways in which feminist politics had marginalized them in the fashioning of intellectual contexts for their struggles. Black feminist movement led by anti-racist feminists, Audre Lorde, when you were talking, I just said she stole my, like, my keynote. <laughs> by by anti-racist feminist, Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith, Bell Hooks, Angela Davis, Paula Giddens, Alice Walker, and the rest of them, many of them. They challenged the gender and discrimination of the black movement and black liber liberation movement and the racial and class discrimination of the women's movement. Black feminists insisted that a full account of the oppression of, the black, of black women must take into consideration other factors such as race and class. Then the third wave, feminists, emerged in the 1990s with women of color calling for a more differentiated feminism and a focus on the feminist politics of location. Third world feminism arrived on the scene with its insurgency against capitalism and imperialism. The danger here is the third world homogenization that ignores the unique histories of countries in the so-called third world. The contextualization and theorization of African feminisms emerged in the 1990s in response to the exclusions and inadequacies of second wave femi Western feminism. African feminisms made further demands on feminism to expand its analytical horizon by incorporating other considerations such as culture, colonialism, ethnicity, and imperialism. And in particular, examining the ways in which these considerations intersect and construct, uh, and construct the reordering and reproducing of gender. African feminists weighed in at this juncture of the feminist journey with the insistence on the specificity of their environment, the diversity and uniqueness of communities therein. African women's intervention played a role in expanding further the feminist vision. Cultural homogenization of African women leads to the othering of African women as figures of deviance that lack agency to act upon the world. But as Audre Lorde rightly says, when we do not develop tools for using human difference as a springboard for create, creative change within our lives, we speak not of human difference, but of human deviance. We should instead 
devise ways to use each other's difference to enrich our visions and our joint struggles. If Western women could only see how unfree they are, they might be able to hear more clearly what elsewhere, what women elsewhere are saying about their priorities and their needs. And then, and then, maybe then, they could begin to discern connections between different histories and locations. Can you do this again for me? The next one. Where, where do you do this? Oh, I just pushed there. Yep. Okay. Now I've, I want to situate Professor Philomena Chioma Steady's work within second wave feminism. Pan-Africanist, scholar, mentor, feminist, pioneer, activist, the Philomena of everything. <laughs> In fact, she's a true Pan-Africanist. She's from Sierra Leone, and she took an Igbo name, Chioma. Her husband also took an Igbo name, Madoka. Chioma, good fortune in Igbo. And it's really good fortune that this great woman belongs to your community. You're fortunate. Unlike the armchair feminist experts who pontificate endlessly about African women, women they hardly know, Philomena Steady is a serious student and scholar of African women. She talks the talk and she walks the walk. Her theoretical and activist approach, which includes a personal commitment to a relational transformative feminism sheds light on distinctly African brand of feminism that is humanistic and transformative. A feminism that is rooted in power sharing, complementarity, accommodation, compromise, negotiation, and inclusiveness. A June a Paradise wonderful essay titled Grassroots Globalization and the research imagination catalogs what he calls global anxieties in the age of globalization. The remedy he proposes for global anxieties is what he calls grassroots globalization or globalization from below. I am reminded here of Professor Sedi's labor of love in Africa. She has worked tirelessly with civil society, grassroots organizations, NGOs, and advocacy, advocacy groups to transform society. Grassroots globalization. You saw globalization from below. And we now locate Professor Steady's extraordinary work within the brief history of feminism I explored earlier. I'm borrowing and recast, recasting the title of Paula Giddens that appeared at that time, when and where I enter. I will speak briefly about where, when and where Professor Steady enters. Professor Steady published her work in 1981, The Black Woman Cross-Culturally. After that, there were publications by black women extraordinary work. The, that period was really vibrant with discussions of issues of race, gender, and all that. We, you know, at that time we had to memorize all these books, you know, if you come, we start citing them chapter by chapter. So we have, uh, you know, the, the women of color 
Morgan Alzaldwell, Angela Davis, or Auntie Audrey Lord, Sister Alcida. And then, but I want to say one thing. It is pro why Professor Steady is special, why she's a pioneer, is her view of the black woman. She has a Pan-African global view of the black woman. If you look at that book, the book has four parts. Part one, Africa. Part two, United States. Part three, the Caribbean. Part four, South America. 80, that time. She went everywhere to look for the black woman. This other text that came at that time, wonderful text, they were saying black woman, black woman. None of them talked about African women. That's why it's not really an indictment on them, but it is a thank you to Philomena for the way she structured her work. The other thing with this work, she, there were men in that volume. 1980. Can you, all those work, whoever had a man writing in those volumes? <laughs> Thirdly, in the Africa section, Philomena invited contribution from African women who are living and working in Africa. And she did it for all those regions. So that's why her work is transformative. Why her work is foundational. Then, it took about six years for us to have a volume like that appear. And it was the one edited by uh, Rosalind Tego Penn, who unfortunately passed away last year on December 25. We remember her. And then the, the women in Africa and the African diaspora. In that volume, Philomena's hand was in that. She had the bleeding chapter in that work. African feminism, listen to that, a worldwide perspective. That's actually what I think the first time we had somebody writing about African feminism, and worldwide too. Now, that volume also had parts. First part, theory and method, Second part, Africa. Another part, the diaspora. And the last part, comparative studies. So she gave us the road map, the road map that we need to study the black woman. Now, can, but what happened with that too is that feminist scholarship knows how to self-correct. Because in the 90s, we started seeing other people when you write, when they were writing, African women were there. For example, theorizing black, is black feminism, edited by Stanley, uh, Stanley James and Abina Boussier. There you could just see that bringing the African, the two collaborators, and even the way they collaborated. It's not just going there and writing about. They met in Wisconsin, Madison, I think, the first meeting. All of them talked. They were still not done. They went to Spelman. Was it Spelman? And they met before that book came out. So we can now see even Patricia Hill Collins, black feminist thought that she published in 1990, said nothing about African women. But then, the second edition, the 10th anniversary of that book that came out in 2000, had African women. So we are happy the way that we are expanding those, you know, visions. Can, we, can you do? Do I have one? 20 minutes? I have 30 minutes? I 
have 30 minutes, so I have to look into it. I told her to be my town. Uh, okay, she said she just go on. No, I told her to be my timekeeper. Now, the next one, listen what uh, Philomena wrote. It came from that uh, African feminism. For women, the, man, the male is not the other, but part of the human same. A gender constitutes the critical half that makes the human whole, the human whole. Neither sex is totally complete in itself to constitute a unit by itself. Each has and needs a complement, despite the possession of unique features of its own. And it reminds me of the fundamental proverb in Igbo land that says, ife polo, ife apudebie. When something stands, something else stands beside it. But it's not really, unkudebe means stands closely, close to it. It has that meaning. What Ali Mazuri calls a theology of nearness. Stands near it. So the way we see those things, so I'm going to use it, you know, because I have problems when I go there to work and I'm listening to women and you're bringing all this thing about center margin, this and this. They can't conceptualize it because they see things that are already together. Now, culture. Flamina uh, uh, study brings up four things in our writing. Culture, collective action, leadership, and I will talk about the third space, which is not, you know, where she works. Professor Steady brings three important elements into the discussion, culture, leadership, and collective action. Yes, culture matters. Professor Steady knows that too well. She does not see a reified construct that occupies a stable site. She teaches us that culture is dynamic in the sense that it derives its meanings, its evolution and reformulation from the encounters and negotiations in it in the context of historical imperatives. She teaches us that African cultures, similar to other cultures, are evolving embracing new terrains with old memories. She notes that the diversity of African continent, notwithstanding, there are shared values that can be used as organizing principles in discussing about Africa. Collective action. Informed by her activist work, she recognized the importance of collective action. She's also written a book about that, leadership, she dives into areas of leadership, transformative leader, servant leader, but more importantly, she zeroes in on followership. Third space is what I see, I've said that that's where I see my work, and that's where I see her work. The third space is where the academy meets what lies be, be, beyond it. That space, that space, it's a vibrant space of articulation where theory meets practice. And we can practice theory and theorize practice. That's where I look at your work. I'm theorizing African feminism, are we, because I want to get back to what I started with, with women and working, you know, and I'll just go through this rapidly, um, African women. So we started to theorize. Look at the Eritrean proverb. Until the lion has a voice, the tales of the hunt will only be those of the hunter. If we don't have our voice, if we are silenced, the hunter, the Western feminist, will be telling the story. So we brought in our voice. African feminism share certain features that mark their provenance and differentiate them from key features of Western feminism, 
African feminisms are not as exclusionary in terms of articulation and gender participation, as Philomena has told us. African feminism, in its articulation, is suffused with the language of compromise, collaboration, negotiation, and inclusion. In its practice, it invites men as partners in social change. Motherhood and maternal politics are not marginalized in African feminism. On the contrary, they have fueled feminist activism in many African contexts. African feminisms are proactive. We are not just reacting. Mark, they mark their specificities, specificities and map priorities that often go beyond the intersection of gender and race and class. If I go to Burodo, if I go to Bayelsa and working with women, they won't intersect anything with race. Race is not an issue. See, where they live or where I live. I lived before I came here. So why am I? They would rather intersect motherhood or something, bring that in the intersection. What defines who they are? So now, I will look at um, theory. Briefly, i go quickly through this. It's the way we have been talking about theorizing. This is really this mostly prestigious and valued mode of production in the academy. If you're a theorist, you're up there. So in fact, when you see how African are positioned in that, we're not the theorists. We produce knowledge that can be structured with people with fantastic brains into theory. See, the, 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 the Bena uh, philosopher, Utonji, he said, it is like we produce the raw material, rubber, palm oil, and they go and manufacture their, their soap and their tires and their literary criticism. So when you see African women in the so-called international volumes, they don't appear in this theory section. It's only, again, I go to Philomena. It's in that 1987 book, Women in Africa and the African Diaspora. You have the first section is theory and methodology. And who was there? It was Philomena. We don't usually, Philomena, we don't appear in those sections. She appeared there, the first act, you know, a chapter there. So normally we don't. We are quarantined in the case studies. Now they want to say about Nigeria, they call Obiaman Nemeka. Can you say something about Nigeria? So that is where we are quarantined, African scholars. In fact, in not too long ago, 2013, a big publishing company published a book titled The Feminist Theory Reader. It has 54 chapters, but only two came from Africa, south of the Sahara, Obiaman Nemekan Ndulovo from Southern Africa. But then it was Barbara Christian who said something very important about, about theory. In that, that he, she said, I am inclined to say that are theorizing, that is black people, and I intentionally, intentionally use the verb rather than the noun, is often in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in the riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, since dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. And I agree. But then we have Western th theorizing, the Cartesian cogito, I think, therefore, I am. And then we build it. What if we take the African proverb that says, I am because we are, and we don't think it can formulate theory. So now culture. What we use for looking at culture, African feminism, is what Claude Ake he made a distinction between tradition and indigenous. And he said, we have to build on the indigenous. 
Tradition is not that, that we have locked away somewhere you can always go and pick. The, and he said, the indigenous is not the traditional. This is no fossilized existence of the African past, African past available for us to fall back on. Only new totalities, however hybrid, we change with each passing day. The indigenous refers to whatever the people consider important to their lives, whatever they regard as an authentic expression of themselves. So we have all these African women who are naming this, and I ended, added my own Nego feminism, the feminism of negotiation. So all these are things we are thinking we, are, we try to do and we try to challenge. Finally, how we're th rethinking feminist epistemologies. I think what undergirds when I look at feminist well, uh, you know, epistemologies, feminist thinking, is a zero sum thinking. This zero sum thinking that tries to create center and margin. It's not like the type of thing Philomena said, or if I follow, if I would have been. In that instant, where is the center and where is the margin? We don't conceptualize it that way. So I go over there and I'm telling them center and margin, and they say, but they're all, they're all touching each other. But we create this center and margin, and the other thing we do is that we create the margin. It's also about valorization. In that instant, is the margin that is not valued. In the instant that uh, Silomina uh, pointed out complementarity, all of them are, both of them are valued. Each one sees the value in the other one. And know that you can't exist without that one. So everything is important. But when we have theory, the center and margin thing, then there's a problem. The other thing is, well, then we talk about inclusion. We spend all their time excluding then after, we start paying. Universities are now paying six-figure salaries to set up president, vice president for its inclusion. What were you doing before when you were excluding? <laughs> so we now start doing all these are, uh, in Nigeria they call it mago mago. You are just doing mago mago. You are just faking all this stuff. <laughs> now, we have to, we are also revising, revisiting intersectionality. When we say what intersects, race, class, this, you go somewhere. Those things don't even intersect for them. As I said, race is not an issue for them. So why are you bringing it up? And then we intersect negativity. Oh, ageism. In Africa, when they want to intersect, it will be age, and it is positive. So we have to see the differences. Then we have to reimagine question of identity and autonomy. And I'll just show a little story. A photographer called Mark Beach in 1985, this man from Pennsylvania, white man, was sent to a far-flung village in Burkina Faso, Piela because he was working for the Mennonite Central Committee, and they were doing a photo book. He was sent there to take photographs of people who worked with them, individual photographs. And he got to Piela, and he had to take the photograph of Sibdu Wada, who was a pediatric nurse, and worked with them. And this is how he, he narrated the story of taking individual photographs. When the moment to photograph finally arrived, I asked Sibdu to stand where the natural light was particularly attractive. Sibdu agreed, then promptly called her four children, the twins and the older son and daughter, to surround her. As I wanted only Sibdu in the photo, I was faced with a problem. As a compromise, I made several images of the family and a few with children in the background as I plotted 
the next location where I might succeed in taking the individual photograph. Sibdo agreed to stand in the doorway of her porch for the next series of images. I asked her that only she be in the photo. She smiled and promptly called her four children <laughs> to stand around her in a foolish effort to isolate, uh, to, in a foolish effort to isolate Sib doing the frame, I moved my camera slightly, hoping I could crop the children out when I printed the photograph in the dark room. But as I moved the camera, Sib do and the children all moved <laughs> in tandem. First one way, then back the other way. Sibdu finally placed the twins in front of her. I was defeated. <laughs> Perhaps it was the dry heat of Burkina Faso or the long days making photographs and interviewing. But I finally understood that a photograph of Sibdu meant a photograph of her children. There was no distinction. Sibdu knew this. She was only waiting for me to understand it as well. When I finally made two images of Sibdu alone, they were lonely images. Sibdu stood uncomfortably in front of the camera. So how do you look at identity in that sense? In 2002, when I worked in the Delta, there were Uborodo women that were protesting. Look at what this woman said. Waria. Chevron, they were protesting against Chevron. They took over the flow station of Chevron very early in the morning and said they were not going to go until you at least show some corporate responsibility. Every day, 2.5 million barrels of oil is scattered away from Nigeria. The last I checked, each barrel was $58.82. And these people have no, she said, build, build school for our children. So they went there and they staged their protest. Look at what she said. Our people are suffering, our children are suffering, and that's why we staged the protest. And they said, we did not collaborate with our husband. They didn't tell them. I do not need my husband to come and convince me to go and fight for a cause that will bring some assistance to me my children, and even my husband. So they left. And eventually, Chevron caved. They had to sign the memorandum of understanding. Now, I want to show you a protest for two minutes. So what happened was they were protesting against um, Kampor, their, their president, who wanted to change this, the Constitution so he could be president for life. So they said no. And they chased him out of the country. He now lives in exile in Cote d'Ivoire. So these women, I, I want a few things for us to see in this short clip about women protesting in, uh, in Burkina Faso. We have sons, we have daughters. 
Look at how they came. And if you look at that, men were there with two protesting with them. And then she raises the ladder. Could, and she says, symbol, it's a symbol of her strength. Although ladle is for kitchen. So she raises that. Now, when you look at kitchen utensils, where are the slides? Because I always said, we look at kitchen as that place women are relegated. In fact, the president of Nigeria four years ago, because he has a wife who is always critical of his government. And he went to Germany, they asked him, he said, no, she doesn't belong out there in policy, she belongs to my kitchen and the, the, and the, bed, and the living room. And I said, he doesn't know what this wife was actually radicalized in the kitchen. Because kitchen, yeah, they cook. It's a place of conversation, gossip, but it's also a place of, you know, plotting. So it is a different place. And then, in fact, in my village, we, men are warned. If you piss your wife off and she runs into the kitchen, better start looking for the exit. <laughs> they have pistol, pistol and ladle. Last Christmas, they sent me a catalog with this thing and they said, oh, you want to buy pistol and mortar? I said, that's not what we call pistol. Mm -hmm. But can we see the next one, the last one? Yeah. So see what, yeah. <laughs> this is peso, a la Senegalese. In Africa, this is peso. Imagine having that thing in your kitchen. Your wife has that in the kitchen. You think you can abuse her? So in fact, the kitchen is an armory. So these women, apart from that, you know, they, they also go there to plan, plan things. So it's, it's not that, in fact, in Sissi Dangaremba's novel, there's this woman, Jeremiah's wife, who is such a troublemaker. They were cooking in the kitchen. She was cooking with other women, and the men were in the big house talking about her. What did she do? She got up from there, went into the men's house, grabbed her husband in her ear, and just told him and said, stop it. <laughs> she heard from the kitchen. So there is so much that one can, can think of in those instances that kitchen is not that subdued place anymore. So I, I probably will then stop here. I, I want to conclude. As far as theory goes, Barbara Christian, he, she, as I mentioned, rightly noted that people of color theorize differently. But can feminist theory create the space for the unfolding of different theorizing, not as isolated engagement outside of feminist theory, but as a force that can have a defamiliarizing power on feminist theory. In other words, seeing feminist theorizing through the eyes of the other, of other places, from the other place, through the other worldview. It has a capacity to defamiliarize feminist theory as we know it and assist it not only in interrogating, understanding, and examining the unfamiliar, but also in refamiliarizing the familiar in more productive and enriching ways. In this instance, Westerners are led across borders so that they can cross back enriched and defamiliarized and ready to see the familiar anew. They see even their own grounds in a new way. How do we deal with the theorizing emanating from other epistemological centers in the so-called third world? How do we come to terms with the multiplicity of centers bound by coherence and decipherment and not disrupted perpetually by differences? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.